My concern in this paper is with legal mandates to engage in cooperation that one otherwise would view as impermissible. A paradigm instance would be the Affordable Care Act with its requirement to provide contraceptive coverage as part of the preventive care services for women. Some object to such coverage because they believe certain contraceptives to be abortifacient, others because they believe the use of contraceptives to be impermissible. Now, for some time, but particularly since the advent of the ACA, I've had a worry about the form that a certain kind of objection takes to that mandate or to similar mandates or directives. And the worry arises right at the point at which those who protested the mandate, as I did, including on public discourse, um, it's just as, a, as an aside, the, uh, if you really wanted to do something nice for me, you would read the article, the most recent article on, or not read it, it doesn't really matter, on assault weapons in public discourse, and just send me a nice email. Um, <laughs> so, that would be fun. And novel. Uh, so the worry arises right at the point which those who, who protested um, raise the issue of religious liberty in the following way. When they ask, is it permissible for the state to coerce the conscience of an institution like Hobby Lobby or the University of Notre Dame, or to force an institution to violate its conscience, or to raise the costs for such an institution of following its conscience, or to put a penalty on the institution for following its conscience? These questions can be posed for this in the same way for individuals. When framed as an objection, the issue is usually addressed by saying that it's wrong for the state to force the individuals to violate their conscience, whether in the limited case, say, of the ACA, or more generally. Right? But generally, it's, it's also asked in a larger frame, right? wrong now, but when would it be permissible for the state to force an individual or an institution to violate its conscience? Right? You have, there has to be some threshold it seems from this standpoint where you're thinking about it in this way, at which the state can force individuals to violate their conscience if they're thinking about blowing up buildings, for instance. Now, I think that something goes wrong in flame, framing the question in these ways, and that this creates a problem for the argument against the mandates and directives in question. And in this talk, I'm going to spend some time diagnosing the problem by focusing on one recent and exceptionally lucid instance of it. In the new book, by uh, my friends Ryan Anderson and Sharif Gurgis and John Corvino debating religious liberty and discrimination. I'll then suggest a possible fix for the argument. As we'll see, the issue here is one of understanding the form of cooperation at stake and the way that deliberation concerning cooperation is affected by law. Anderson and Gurgis start their argument with a claim. So if you're not familiar with the book, it's a, it is a literally a debate. Um, Anderson and Gerges have a couple of different sections, and Corvino has his own independent sections, and then they discuss with one another. And I'm really focusing on what Anderson and Gerges say. They start their claim with a, their argument with a claim that I agree with, that religion and integrity are basic goods. Religion's being a basic good is a ground for the state's taking religious liberty to be an important value to protect. The fundamental purpose of the state is to empower, to make possible the self-determining pursuit of basic goods by citizens and residents together and in cooperation. So freedom in respect of the pursuit of any basic good is important. And religion being one such good, protecting religious freedom is essential to the state's task. A further relevant point that receives a little bit, maybe a little bit, but not much attention, attention in the book is this. Even a perfectionist state committed to promoting basic goods and not, like Rawls's state, neutral with regard to substantive conceptions of the good, has limits to its authority across all the basic goods, differing from good to good right, with regards to its determinations of what constitutes a successful pursuit of that good. The state can say something about what health is and what it's not about what's known and what's not, about what's beautiful and what's not, and can, in some cases, restrict liberty to pursue the counterfeit. It can and should often take steps to specially favor recognizably successful instances of the pursuit of real goods. But there are limits in each of these cases, more extensive in the latter two, I'd say, but still present even in the health case, and the state needs to exercise some restraint with regards to the question of whether some activities really are healthy or not whether some purported acts of knowledge really are knowledge or not, whether some things really are or are not beautiful. And where religion is concerned, 
the state has very little epistemic authority to make determinations about the truth of this or that religion or the legitimacy of the demands made by this or that religion. And lacking such authority, it needs to exercise restraint with regard to a number of judgments that private citizens are licensed to make. That restraint is a contributing factor to the degree of freedom that a state should allow citizens and residents in the pursuit of religion. I'd say that the state needs to be much more tolerant of hucksterism in religion than in medicine, for example. The general conclusion to be drawn from these points, that religion is a basic good, that the state exists to empower persons to pursue basic goods, and that the state is limited in competence to determine what a successful pursuit of religion amounts to, entail that, quote, Respect for this basic good entails respect for your freedom to pursue it by your best lights. So that's Anderson and Gerges. This is one general principle governing the state's relationship to religion that they identify, and it will be important to my claims later. A further claim made by Anderson and Gerges, with which I agree, is that it is always wrong to intend damage to a basic good. So because religion is a basic good, any action undertaken to restrict liberty precisely as religious would fall afoul of this norm. Preventing people from fulfilling what they take to be their religious duties on those grounds, namely that that's what they take to be their religious duties, seems to me a violation of this principle. Similarly, integrity being a basic good, any effort on anyone's part, including the state, to induce an agent to violate his or her conscience is always wrong. The means of the inducement doesn't matter. If the point is to get the agent to violate their conscience as an end or as a means, then the action is wrong and should never be done. That just seems to me to follow, right? It's wrong to intend people to do what is wrong for them to do, and it's wrong for them to violate their conscience, so it has to be wrong for you to intend them to violate their conscience. That this attempt should be accomplished by seduction or threat makes no moral difference. So a second principle is identified by Anderson and Gerges, no direct attacks on your religious freedom and we could add no direct attacks on conscience either. But isn't that, and here's the sort of first pass at the problem, which we'll then get to in the context of cooperation a little bit down the road, isn't that what's happening when we prevent the Aztec from engaging in human sacrifice, as we do? His conscience says we must sacrifice, and yet we stop him. Or, closer to home, when we prevent George Reynolds from taking a second wife when his religion tells him that he should. George Reynolds was a Mormon in the 19th century who was part of a very important case, Reynolds versus the United States. Uh, The Mormons were trying to uh, argue that religious liberty should make it possible for them to take more than one wife. Uh, And Reynolds eventually lost that case. Was he being, was, was the state violating his conscience or forcing him to violate his conscience in in asking him or telling him to stop? I think that the answer to this question is no. This isn't what the law is doing. Note first that both the Aztec and Reynolds believe that they're under a positive obligation. Reynolds thinks he has an obligation to take a second wife. The Aztec thinks that he has an obligation to engage in human sacrifice. But these kinds of obligations are never absolute. They depend upon the balance of reasons given the particular circumstances. Corvino, in his discussion of the Reynolds case, I think describes Reynolds' obligation accurately. He says, quote, Reynolds argued that he was morally obliged to take multiple wives, circumstances permitting. Right? So even the most stringent obligation, such as the obligation to feed your children, the positive obligation to feed your children, right, is, can, is defeasible. If you don't have any food, right, then you're not in violation for having failed to do that. The law is such a circumstance in the following way. When a law is passed or judged to have application in the territories, as in the Reynolds case, that is a new circumstance, the circumstance of there being a new reason for action. Indeed, it is reason-giving in a very direct sense, for laws just are intended to be reasons for us, and for the most part, exclusionary reasons in the sense identified by Joseph Raz, They're not simply another reason that's added to the balance of existing reasons. They're supposed to silence the other reasons that are already in play. That does not mean that the law itself can never rightly be overridden. We can have reasons strong enough to justify ignoring or breaking the law. But that's not the norm, nor is it the case envisaged by lawmakers when they pass a law. Rather, the intent of the lawmakers is to offer, in the passing of the law, a new and authoritative reason to potential polygamists, virgin sacrificers, suicide bombers, 
or what have you, to not do the thing which formally they felt obliged in conscience to do. Formally, they thought they had sufficient reason in conscience that they were under an obligation to do this, and the law is attempting to give them a reason, an exclusionary reason, not to do this thing, in virtue of it being a law. So the paradigm case of a law that rightly prevents an agent from doing what they ex ante believe they have an obligation to do is not one of overriding respect for conscience or coercing conscience or directly attacking religious liberty. Of course, it could be these things. Anti-polygamy laws directed against Mormons seem uh, historically to be something of a hybrid, motivated both by a concern for the institution of marriage and family, but also, I think, kind of obviously by hostility towards that religion. But the paradigm case rather respects conscience by offering a reason in the form of law to the agent that the agent could follow, having taken that reason into consideration and then made a new judgment of conscience. Obeying the law in this case does not require that the agent violate or act against conscience, for the presence of the law creates the need for a new judgment of conscience that takes into account the law as a reason, and indeed as an authoritative reason. Of course, you might judge that you should still do the thing that you previously thought was obligatory, and, being afraid of penalties and punishments, you might decide not to do so contrary to your conscience. You might take into account the law, think I should still do this thing, but then because you're afraid of what's going to happen if you break the law, you follow the law. That is acting against your conscience. It's violating it. But it's not, or at least it need not be and should not be, intended by the law or by lawmakers. Lawmakers accept as a side effect that some will violate their conscience in acting in accordance with the law, and often that side effect is reasonably accepted by the lawmakers. Also accepted are certain burdens on religious liberty. George Reynolds is not at liberty to do as he once thought he should and take a second wife. In the paradigm case, that restriction on liberty is, I think, intended. The intention is to restrict liberty for the sake of the common good. But it's not intended under the description restricting religious liberty. That is, it's not as religious that the liberty is restricted, but rather as a liberty that's injurious to the common good. Making this distinction highlights the point that in restricting, for example, Mormon polygamy, the state need not have been intentionally damaging any basic good, if it were acting wholly uprightly, since liberty is merely an instrumental good. So, in the paradigm case of a criminal restriction on an action, one that's religiously motivated, uh, that is judged by lawmakers to be contrary to the common good, in fact, so contrary that it must be made an offense and violations punished, There's no violation of what I identified earlier as the second principle, no intentional damage to a basic good, and not really, if the judgment was appropriate, a violation of the first, namely respect freedom to pursue religion. The reasonable state generally gives you liberty to pursue religion according to your lights and indirectly burdens that liberty, that is, religious liberty, only when there are sufficiently good reasons to do so. Now, this looks like we're moving into a third norm that Anderson and Gerges introduce. Respect for the basic good of religion, quote, gives the state some reason to avoid indirect burdens on religious liberty in more stringent ways than the state protects other liberties. They think that if a liberty is religious liberty, then the state has an even greater reason to protect it. That is, the indirect burden on Reynolds' religious liberty must be justified to a high degree for the state to be warranted in restricting it. I think that this is true, and I'll return to this claim, but to repeat, I don't think we should say of the Reynolds case that the state has forced him to violate his religion or penalized him for acting with integrity or given him the option of accepting fines or punishments or surrendering his integrity. The fact of the law, again, gives him a reason for having only one wife, and from the standpoint of the law, burdens to his liberty qua religious and threats to his integrity were side effects. As an aside, I don't think that this analysis is applicable. This is the one case in which I think it's not, what I'm saying is not applicable, when the law tells you to do something that you take to be always and everywhere impermissible. There, violating your conscience, acting contrary to what conscience says you should never do, is a constitutive means of doing what, of your doing what you're told to do, whatever your ultimate reason is for doing it. You're afraid of being killed, so when the government tells you to forswear your religion, you do so contrary to your judgment of conscience. 
But if you can't so forswear without violating conscience, then the government can't tell you to do this without intending that you violate your conscience. And so this is something that the government should never make anyone do. This is a strong claim. I think it's true. It should never require someone to do what they take to be always and everywhere wrong. And it seems to me that just governments don't, in fact, do this. The attempt recurring to get priests to divulge information from the confessional would be an act of this sort and is ruled out by the second principle, the principle that you shouldn't intentionally damage or act against a basic good. So is the attempt to get someone to swear to a religious belief that he doesn't possess or indeed a belief about anything that he does not possess. And I think this is why it's not just reasonable but obligatory for the state to provide exemptions from fighting war, from fighting in war to pacifists. Now, Reynolds' example involves criminal law, but I think, tentatively, that the analysis should be similar for regulatory law. The regulations identify how things will be done in common. You might have had reasons for doing things otherwise, even weighty, reason, weighty reasons, and even religious reasons. But the law, again, is in the business of giving you new reasons to consider, preeminent among them the fact that there is a law saying that you should do things in this way. In making such a requirement, the law is clearly restricting liberty, and in some cases indirectly restricting religious liberty. That indirect restriction is, I think, something that we could reasonably identify as an indirect burden on a person's religion. And in ways that I'll try to describe in the next two paragraphs, I think that whether the law is criminal or regulatory makes some difference to how we think of those indirect burdens and requests for accommodation or exemption. In the case of either kind of law, indirect burdens constitute a reason not to pass the law. And to say that the, the law is going to have an effect on people's ability to pursue their religious lives to the best that they can, right? that's a reason not to pass the law in question. Making polygamy a criminal offense in the 1860s, even for the best reasons, is going to restrict many religious citizens' efforts to live out their religious convictions as best they can. Being a good million, I think a necessary condition for that restrictions being reasonable is that identified by Mill's harm principle. There must be interpersonal, non-consensual non harm for the law, the criminal law, to be justified. But that's not a sufficient condition, obviously. The harm needs to be significant enough to justify restricting liberty and burdening religious liberty and generating the host of other negative side effects that the imposition of the criminal law brings. But if the law really meets this threshold, then I don't see any room for exemptions for it to be reasonable. Acting contrary to the law, if the law meets this threshold, is acting contrary to the common good. But of course there can be circumstances not envisaged or ignored by the lawmakers <coughs> where the restricted actions are not, in fact, a sufficiently serious source of harm in those circumstances, that they should be restricted in those circumstances, and that restrict restricting them burdens religious liberty. If such cases become apparent, then it would be unjust not to rewrite the law to accommodate persons in those circumstances. That seems a requirement of justice and has application beyond religious liberty. Criminalization of anything is unjust if it doesn't meet the high threshold. Discovering, for example, that an action deemed a criminal offense is one essential to certain religious rites, such as consecration in a Catholic mass, and that the actions are, under these circumstances, not harmful and not likely to bring about harmful actions, creates an obligation to accommodate religion in the law itself. In the case of regulatory law, the threshold for both accommodation and exemption seems potentially lower. After all, the value, of the, law, the value the law seeks is the value of there being a common way of doing things. That value is a function of the coordinating effect of the law both in itself and giving us a common way so as not to come into conflict with one another, and in the subsequent good effects that a common way typically makes possible, effects often related to health and safety. But the other possible ways of doing things ruled out by such a law need not be unjust or even unsafe or unhealthy. So the refusal to accommodate other ways when they're religiously motivated, and hence are owed some deference because of the importance of religious liberty, needs to be justified by showing that the accommodation or exemption would be so disruptive of the possibility of the common way and its subsequent good effects that an accommodation or exemption just wouldn't work. So if you're going to create indirect burdens on religious liberty in regulating the common life of the citizenry, the threshold for granting accommodations or exemptions can generally be pretty low, unlike in the case of criminal law. 
But if the threshold is met, then I think it's an obligation for those interested in making good laws that they accommodate or exempt. Note that I've framed this discussion entirely in terms of religious liberty and indirect burdens on that liberty. It's the value of religious liberty and the presumption of such liberty that's doing all or most of the work, not concerns about coercion of conscience. And this brings us to the kinds of cases that we're concerned with here in this conference, cases that are not quite like the George Reynolds case. They do not involve the state telling someone not to fulfill an ex-ante duty that they take themselves to have, such as to take a second wife. Rather, they involve the state telling someone to engage in an act that they would otherwise have ruled out on grounds that this act would make them complicit in another's wrongdoing, that is, that it would be an illicit form of cooperation with evil. The question is, what is the relationship between these kinds of cases and the second and third principles above? Right? The principle that you not directly act contrary to a basic good and the principle that you not burden religious liberty indirectly without sufficient reason. Are these cases, right, these cases in which some action is compelled that will be a form of cooperation, are these cases in which the state coerces an agent contrary to conscience? Or are they cases in which the state is rightly or wrongly imposing indirect burdens on the agents in question? And if the latter, on what grounds should we judge that burdening right or wrong? Now here's where my analysis differs from Anderson and Gerges's, and it seems to be many others. For on the one hand, they accept that sometimes the state can be justified in coercing an agent to do that which he had previously judged would involve immoral complicity. But they also describe these cases in the way that I've said that indirect burden cases should not be described. They describe them as putting a high price on integrity, as pressuring agents into deficiencies of integrity, as forcing a violation of conscience, and the like. This relates to a claim that they make that integrity and religion are both fragile goods, that they're put in jeopardy by laws that create indirect burdens. The fragility of these goods is what, in turn, for them justifies strict scrutiny of the law. The state needs a compelling reason for imposing the burden, and it must take the least restrictive means in pursuing its ends, um, the means that are going to be least indirectly burdening. This line of thought then generates their discussion, which I think is very illuminating, of anti-discrimination laws. But even there, Anderson and Gerges speak, for example, of the conditions under which, quote, we should therefore coerce Jones against his conscience, end quote. That, to my mind, is either an unhappy way of saying that we may in such cases restrict his liberty and indirectly his religious liberty or liberty of conscience, or it's saying that the complicity cases are not really like the George Reynolds case as I've described it but are in fact justified cases of coercion of conscience. But I think, for reasons that I've given, that there are no such cases. There are no cases of justified coercion of conscience, no cases where you're justified in intending to get somebody to violate their conscience. Rather, I think that the complicity cases are just like the George Reynolds case in the relevant ways. They should be understood as involving restrictions on liberty and indirect burdens on religious liberty or liberty of conscience but they do not coerce anyone to act against their conscience, nor do they put a penalty on conscientious acts. However, there are good reasons for the state to be wary of limiting liberty in these particular ways without very good reasons. So let's consider the complicity worries of a Catholic university, such as the fictitious University of Our Lady. As fictitious, the University of Our Lady accepts the Catholic position on contraception. Oh, no, as Catholic, the University of Our Lady accepts the Catholic position on contraception. My mistake. All marital acts should be open to new life. And so when the University of Our Lady is, in an unrestricted context, considering which insurance plans to make available to its employees, it screens out those plans that offer contraceptive coverage. Why? Because unless there are other reasons to consider, and this is important in what comes up, unless there's other reasons to consider, the only reason to add those plans would be to make contraceptives available to its employees. And that gives a reason precisely insofar as UOL is interested in making their use possible for its employees. Right? That is, the fact that it provides is only a reason if you're interested in providing contraceptives, if that screening out all other possible reasons. But UOL, that's the University of Our Lady, thinks that this use is morally impermissible and is immoral, immoral to intend to facilitate what it's impermissible to do, so UOL makes a conscientious judgment that it should not choose such plans. Being Catholic, 
UOL explains this using traditional Catholic language. To choose such plans for that reason would be formal cooperation in wrongdoing, cooperation which willed the wrongdoing itself. Of course, even for the University of Our Lady, that, that such plans would facilitate contraception among its employees is not usually the only reason to consider in deliberating about what plan to choose. Those plans might also be cheapest. Those plans might be the only way for employees with irregular cycles or other medical reasons for taking hormonal contraceptives to get them inexpensively. Let's suppose that those plans are the cheapest. Then UOL might choose those plans to save money with the side effect that they make contraception easier for some employees. If that is its conscientious judgment, then UOL is not choosing those plans against its conscience, even if it would conscientiously decide against those plans if the only reason for them were that they provided contraceptives. Right? They're not saying, well, I'm going to choose the, to get the cheapest one contrary to my conscience. Right? The fact that it's cheapest is factored into their judgment of conscience. And if the price difference is great enough and its employees are adequately catechized, UOL might not only conscientiously, but I think even rightly judge that it has good enough reason to purchase those plans. Right? Might reasonably get the cheapest plan, um, especially if it can foresee that there will be limited or perhaps even no right, side effects right, of the form that its employees are using the, contraception, the, the hormonal contraceptives as contraceptives. Now go back to the original scenario in which UOL has judged that it should not provide the plans because it doesn't want to formally cooperate in impermissible actions. Congress then passes the Affordable Care Act, and eventually the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, rules that certain provisions in the ACA require all employers to provide health insurance that covers contraceptives with certain exceptions. There will be a health penalty levied on any employers who do not so provide. The University of Our Lady is now in a new context for deliberation and choice, a context made possible by the authoritative passing of a law. But that law can't reasonably be interpreted as either coercing them in respect of their previous judgment of conscience or even levying a penalty on that judgment of conscience. The law is giving the University of Our Lady a new reason to purchase a particular insurance plan, and purchasing it for that reason would ensure that the UOL is not formally cooperating in evil. And this is a point on which I think you and I disagree. Of course, it might still be wrong for the University of Our Lady to comply. But the reason, whatever it is, that it would be wrong is not the same as the reason it would have been wrong to provide the insurance coverage in the first place. Put another way, where it would have been wrong ex ante on grounds of formal cooperation with evil, its wrongness ex post must derive from some other source, such as, for instance, the obligation to provide adequate witness to Catholic teaching. It seems to me that's a separate reason. It can still stand after the law and, in fact, probably should stand in most of the cases that we're concerned about. So where claims of complicity grounded in worries about formal cooperation are concerned, the law operates in the same way it operates where claims of positive obligation are concerned. It provides new reasons that require new deliberation and choice, and any violating of conscience that occurs afterwards is merely an accepted side effect from the law's standpoint. Moreover, in at least some, and I think many cases, uh, well, in at least some, I think not in, maybe not, it depends on which institutions we're talking about. In some cases, the institutions in question could be justified in complying for the sake of following the law and avoiding penalties. In other cases, it's not justified. And that's what made it, I think, inappropriate for an institution like the actual University of Notre Dame to describe what the government was doing as attempting to force it to violate its conscience. For suppose the possible world in which they lose their appeal, right, um, they're told that they do need to comply, right, and now on the sort of story that I've told, they reconsider and take into account the reasons that the authoritative law gives them for complying. Right, um, if they eventually then decide that they should and could comply, that is to say to provide the relevant insurance coverage, then they're actually acting in accordance with their conscience, right, given that they've judged that they should comply with the law. On the other hand, if they lose their appeal and then provide the coverage contrary to their conscience, right, they're, told, uh, uh, they're told that they, um, that they have, to, have to provide, right, and then they still think they shouldn't provide, but they do provide, right, um, then that is acting contrary to the conscience. Uh, but that violation of conscience is a side effect from the standpoint of the law 
and not a violation that they were coerced into. Right? It's, it's another way of putting that is to say it's on them, it's on Notre Dame that they're violating their conscience and not on the state in that case. I think that this analysis is problematic for Anderson and Gerges. Among other things, it raises questions about the fragility of integrity in religion as goods. I think that there's something to the fragility claim. These two goods can be and have been directly targeted by states, precisely wanting to change their citizens' religious and conscientious beliefs and wanting to persecute citizens who would not change. The laws of England under Elizabeth and James targeting Catholic worship and belief to a great extent worked in eliminating Catholicism, evidence of the fragility of religion and conscience. They're also fragile in the way that any reflexive good is. They depend for their successful achievement on choice, and human beings are notoriously bad choosers. But these are not the senses of fragility meant by Anderson and Gerges. They think that integrity, for example, is fragile because it's jeopardized by the states telling you not to do what you take yourself to have an obligation to do. And here's a quotation from them. Quote, to respect self-determination, the state simply needs to let you choose and pursue some projects. Not necessarily the ones you have already or most prefer. You need only a respectable range of options. But if you're pressured into flouting even one of your perceived obligations, you're stuck. Your integrity is cracked. So we should scrutinize legal burdens on conscience more exactingly than legal burdens on other commitments or projects. The same goes for burdens on obligations you have on religious grounds. Right? So the reason that you need to scrutinize religious uh, laws affecting religion at a higher degree of scrutiny right, is because when those laws are passed, they're passed in such a way that is going to, that are going to coerce you to violate your conscience, and this plays into the fragility claim. It's true, I think, that if you're pressured into flouting a perceived obligation, you're stuck. But it's false, I think, and this is what I've been trying to show, that the state is so pressuring you in either the case where it attempts to stop you from doing something that you take yourself to have a positive obligation to do, have a second wife, or where it attempts to get you to cooperate materially in something you took yourself to have an obligation not to cooperate formally in, provide contraceptives for your employees or contraceptive insurance for your employees. And so fragility can't really do the work that Anderson and Gerges wanted to do in justifying heightened scrutiny where burdens of religious liberty and conscience are concerned. So then what does or can do the work? As I suggested earlier, I think the answer is this. The state should restrict liberty generally only when it has good reason. And what counts as good reason differs in the criminal, criminal and regulatory context. It should restrict liberty only when it has good reason to do so. And insofar as that re liberty restricted is religious liberty, that gives the state additional reason for restraint, even though the fact that the liberty is religious is incidental to the state's purposes. And the reasons for this are straightforward. Liberty of all sorts is essential to the constitution of the state's citizens, and the state exists primarily for the sake of enabling that self-constitution. Religion is a basic good, and the liberty exercised in self-constituting efforts of citizens to pursue that basic good is thus also a prominent concern of the state. One could ask, is the desire, this is just as an aside, is the desire to provide contraceptives for all women as part of a preventive services package, is that a good enough reason for the state to restrict liberty or for it to indirectly burden religious liberty? I think the answer is no, but that's the sort of positive case that you'd need to make. So state restrictions and requirements affecting religious liberty can be criticized in three ways. First, they can be criticized on grounds that they deliberately target religion as such, or religious liberty as religious liberty. And I'll come back to this below. Second, they can be criticized because they deliberately restrict liberty without adequate reason. And third, they can be criticized because they incidentally burden religion and religious liberty without adequate reason. That the liberty, is rest that the liberty restricted is religious gives the state a reason to tread even more carefully than it otherwise should. But I'm skeptical that there is a radical change of quality of reasons for the state as is suggested by the fragility claims that Anderson and Gerges make. Consider, there are good reasons for the state not to burden the liberty of, say, cow owners by over-regulating the sale of raw milk. It infringes on the self-constitution or self-determination of those cow owners. If the sale of raw milk really does pose serious health risks, then perhaps the state should regulate it. But without good reason to do so, it is presumptively wrong for the state to regulate that sale. And even if regulation is reasonable, there can be good reasons for some accommodations and exemptions in cases where the regulation will burden some excessively 
and in which the accommodation ex and exemptions will not undo the good sought by the regulations overall. Similarly, there are good reasons for the state not to burden the liberty of religious citizens by over-regulating their attempts to create institutions that operate in accordance with their own conception of the good and the right. If some particular way of doing things is essential to the common good, then regulation may be necessary. But without good reason to do so, it's presumptively wrong for the state to overregulate, even when it could, for the reasons that I've given, be even when it could even when it could be reasonable for the institution to act in accordance with the state's regulations. Right? That is to say, sometimes the institution has reasons to act as the state is telling it to do, even though the state should not have told it to act in that way. And even when the state does take itself to have good reasons for regulation, it can and should create accommodations for those whose religious liberty will be additionally restricted if those accommodations will not be serious threats to the common way or the goods achieved by the common way. To take a concrete case, um, and I'm close to the end, uh, consider the decision in Massachusetts to require all adoption agencies without exception to place children in same-sex households. It's not obvious to me that the Catholic Church in Boston could not under any circumstances have complied with this requirement. There were very important reasons of witness not to, as well as a whole host of prudential reasons. And in the particular case, I think they were correct to refuse. But I don't see that it would be always and everywhere wrong to comply. There are imaginable circumstances in which compliance would have been the right thing if, for example, noncompliance would have had terrible consequences for many adoptable children. That might be wrong, and probably most people here might disagree with that, but start with that thought. Nevertheless, in the absence of very good reasons for the requirement and for allowing no accommodations, it's a serious infringement of liberty and, incidentally, of religious liberty for the state to say, effectively, you can't decide how to run an adoption agency in line with your moral and religious principles. It must be done our way with no exceptions. It's hard to see how that requirement was met. The common way and its good effects just don't seem threatened by allowing the archdiocese to continue as before. And for good liberal reasons, the requirement that there be a common way can't be justified merely on the grounds that the Catholic Church in Boston is mistaken as to the truth about matters of sex, family structure, religion, etc. The state has some competence to determine that some ways of raising children and some beliefs about sex are contrary to the common good. But how can its competence extend to a determination that the Catholic Church is wrong in matters that are considered by the Church essential to salvation and that don't involve obvious abuse? I think that judgment is beyond the state's competence. But in the Boston case and in others, it looks like that's part of the purpose of the regulations. The judgment is not that an essential need of the common good is going unmet, but that a moral teaching must be accepted. That does not seem to be very liberal, and it looks like an attempt to restrict religious liberty as such and not as a side effect, something the state shouldn't be in the business of doing. And that's why it seems reasonable, and in fact right, to me that the Boston Archdiocese refused to go along, even if perhaps it could have, right? Even if there's some possible world in which it could have done so. It was, among other things, important to protest the overreach of the state and to refuse to allow the state to get mixed up in decisions that rightly belonged to the Archdiocese. This criticism can be made, however, without talking about the state's forcing or attempting to force any violation of the Archdiocese's conscience. And here is where I reconverge with Anderson and Gerges, who I think admirably lay out the ways in which the common good might be sufficiently threatened by some person or institution's efforts at self-constitution such that those efforts should be restricted. And when they do, it seems to me that they occasionally speak in ways that are quite friendly to what I'm suggesting are the principles that should guide the state. On page 179 of their book, where they identify the conditions under which an anti-discrimination bill could be passed, they speak of this as, quote, defeating the presumption of liberty. That presumption of liberty is what I've been arguing should be doing most of the work in a just society, rather than the fragility of goods of religion or integrity. Or perhaps it would be more accurate to say, the presumption of liberty plus general considerations of justice and the common good. But when Anderson and Gerges, a couple pages later, asked whether some attempt to eliminate certain social meanings is warranted, quote, at the price of moral or religious integrity, end quote, I see that as a step in the wrong direction toward a position about which I've tried to articulate some concerns. So to conclude, in the briefest way possible, I think Catholics generally should refrain from criticizing laws that mandate some form of cooperation with the state on the grounds that it forces them to violate their conscience, unless there are good reasons for that, for thinking that that is the state's aim. 
In the more ordinary case, although increasingly perhaps the less ordinary case, we'll see. In the more ordinary case, Catholics should make the argument that the law is unjust, that it unjustly restricts liberty, unreasonably burdens religion, and, as is very frequently the, the case, that it favors what is not genuinely for the sake of the common good. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, for your talk, which I, which I enjoyed. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. I want to raise an example concerning the thesis that it's always intrinsically wrong to force someone to violate his or her conscience. So consider a case, consider something like the Terry Schiavo type case, someone who's in a uh, resistant vegetative state and so forth, and only needs hydration and food in order to stay alive. And suppose that the, the only means by which this could be provided are, are, are some, is some sort of medical procedure that you need a certain special expertise in order to insert the feeding tube or what I don't know what it involves but so you've got professionals that have to do it now suppose these professionals have all been reading Peter Singer and they become convinced that it would be wrong it would be gravely wrong to keep someone in that situation alive so that it's not just that we may allow the person to starve to death but we ought to do so and yet they're the only ones who could uh, carry out the procedure to keep this person alive it seems in this case that, what, that to force them to, care, to, to implement that procedure would be to force them to violate their consciences, however badly formed their consciences are. And yet that we ought nevertheless to do that, because not to do that would entail an injustice to the patient, um, even though we'd be forcing someone to violate his conscience. So anyway, I just wondered if you could speak to that sort of case. Sure. So two, two things. Um, one is that if, if the case really is a case, and the second point, uh, we'll maybe question that, but the, if the case really were a case in which uh, a physician thought that there's something that, uh, that they, they should not do ever, right, um, and the best judgment of the medical community or the state is that um, if you're a doctor, then you need to do things, do this. Then it seems to me that doesn't actually violate the principle. I mean, the principle that I articulate is very strict, but it's also pretty limited, right? The state should never make you do something that's contrary to your conscience. Um, I, nobody should ever do that. But that is not usually met by um, prescriptions of the form, if you are an X, then you must do Y, right? If you are a physician under these circumstances, then you must do this other thing. Because, of course, there is an option for you, which is to cease to become a physician. And presumably, the medical profession does and or should and does, right, make prescriptions of that form, right? If you're a doctor, right, and somebody comes, you know, comes to you and can't pay, but they're going to die unless you get, then you must provide them the service. And if you're not willing to do that, then you should cease to be a doctor. I think that's that's acceptable, right? You have to get the boundaries of that conditional right, right? You have to get the the forms of action that are required correct, and you can go wrong in that. And you can say if somebody comes to you and says that they want. Uh, you to perform surgery on them that is going to make them a man when they were when they used to be a woman, right? Then the you know you're overstepping your boundaries if you if you put the conditional. If you're a doctor, then you must provide that surgery. But that kind of prescription does seem to be acceptable. I think the second point is that um, it's not clear even you know if you're if you're a, if you're a d devotee of Peter Singer and you're a doctor that you do think of this as a negative, an exceptionless, absolute negative precept in the way that I'm talking about. Because um, it's not, it doesn't seem to me easy that you can specify in any morally neutral way the action kind that you're talking about. What you're really saying is, if you've prudentially determined that no good is to be done by this or to be served by this sort of procedure, then you should refuse to do it. But then it requires an assessment of whether, in fact, the good can be served or is not going to be served. It's not like the prescription against the, the prohibition against killing the innocent, right? Where sort of, you can identify the action type, and right? here's an instance of intentionally killing the innocent, and then say, okay, move that out of consideration. So it's not obvious that it, it falls into that, but even if it does, I think that first consideration is adequate to deal with that. Thanks. Yeah, Michael. Chris, I have, thank you for your paper. I have a question about um, how the law how a new law, say, gives a new reason for my conscience that might lead me to make a new and different decision of conscience. So, um, if I understood you correctly, you, you, you were not understood that, understanding that as saying 
the law, the penalties that come from the law give me a new reason. That wasn't your point. Right. But the fact that I'm required to do something yeah. or not do something by law, that's the reason. Yes. Okay, so here's the, what I don't understand yet about what you're saying. Um, you aren't saying, I take it, that if it's the law, that's it, because you allow that some laws are unjust laws. Right. Okay, so maybe you already knew where I'm going with this. Um, if, unless we're in a case where it's just sort of morally neutral thing, like whether you drive on the right or the left, like I could see that in a case like that, the law just overrules whatever I might enjoy doing or want to do, or maybe I think that like the British way is better, but like, that's stupid, right? I should, because it really is neutral, but, um, Leaving aside things like that, where it's a merely a matter of convention, um, the law is going to. So here's how the argument goes: the argue, the law actually gives me a reason to act only if the law is just. Um, but that means that law, as such, it, uh, there's a sense in which the fact that there's like this duly enacted statute, that is not what's important to me. What's important to me is whether it's a just law or not. And if I think it's an unjust law, then it doesn't give me a reason to act. So. Um, in all, it's sort of the cases that you're talking about, where I think I like I'm obliged to have multiple wives, or I'm obliged not to perform an abortion, or whatever. The fact that there's a law in cases like this, the fact that I'm legally required just isn't going to make any difference. Yeah. I, I disagree with that. I mean, so, and here are two two examples. Um, I think you're obliged to pay your taxes, right? But it seems plausible that most tax law is screwing you, right? It's unjust. Um, it's still, you still have, I think you have a reason, and I think a very strong reason, right, to pay your taxes. Um, it's also the case that I think if you have uh, pretty good religious reasons for smoking peyote, right, and the law makes smoking peyote a criminal offense, um, that you now have a very good reason, and actually I think under most circumstances, um, right, a, a strong exclusionary and not defeated, not in fact defeated reason, not to smoke peyote, right? It's an unjust law, I think. Right, that says that you can't do this, even in circumstances where it's for the sake of your, um, your, you know, the religious obligations that you take yourself to have. But I think you should follow the law. Right, that's not the kind of injustice. I mean, where where that runs out, it seems to me, is typically going to be in cases in which, I mean, always in the cases where the law is telling you to do something that is positively unjust towards somebody else. Right, and then you're going to have reasons for overriding. It's because you just spell, uh, what are the situations in which I'm obliged to follow an unjust law? I guess that's, in a way, yeah. what the question is. Um, there are going to be situations in which uh, the, the costs of your not following it right, um, are going to be sufficiently damaging to the law, right, to the, the, the stability of the law, um, and in which you have pretty good reasons for being a law-abiding person generally. Right? The fact that there's this one, you know, rupture in the fabric of the law at some particular juncture, um, you know, is a bad thing. But generally, you take it that the presence of the law is a good thing, and you want to signal and be, in fact, an upright, law-abiding person. If you want to signal and be an upright, law-abiding person, then that means you need to follow the laws, and you should do that, generally speaking, as long as it's not um, leading you to do injustice to other people. Right? You can. There, it seems to me that there's a wide variety of circumstances in which you should accept some cost to yourself. Right, some negative you know, burdens that you're going to suffer, right, as the price of being a generally upright and law-abiding citizen. Well, I think you know, part of there, is there is there a limit to that? There surely has to be. At some point, the burdens are going to be so sufficient on you that that you should say, no, I just can't keep paying these taxes. Um, and then you know, like then maybe Italian. you shouldn't. Right? What's that? Like if you're Italian. Like if you're Italian, right? Fair enough. Yeah. That's what people say. Yeah. Uh, what if the law um, is intended to? to how to violate your conscience. In other words, um, a law such as making that, that bakery, making that cake for that gay wedding. In other words, the law is specifically intended to uh, violate a religious principle. What would you say to that? Um, yes, so I think uh, are, are all such laws intended in that way? I'm not convinced that they are, although it certainly seems like increasingly they're trending in that direction, and they're at least like what I called the hybrid laws that were attempting to prevent Mormons from um, having multiple wives. I think even there, right, um, that that the law is intending to get you to violate your conscience by providing a cake uh, 
I mean, it's it's not the case that by, that baking a cake of any sort is the sort of thing that is intrinsically impermissible, right? It it depends on who you're baking the cake for and what reasons you have for baking the cake. Um, so I I think that even there, right, um, in light of maybe extreme penalties, right, one could I don't think it's a prudential judgment. One could decide that what they need to do is bake the cake in this circumstance, and that is that is not a violation of their conscience, even when the state was intending to get them to violate their conscience. I think that's that puts you in a difficult position because, of course, it's going to look like you're violating your conscience if you said that you didn't, and that's a reason not to do the thing. But the reason, the relevant reason is not that you would be violating your conscience in that case, but that you'd be giving scandal by appearing to violate your conscience. I just wanted to hop back to your answer about uh, like the medical profession and the conditional responses. Mm -hmm. It seems like those would apply to the vast majority of cases. For instance, um, with Little Sister, you know, well, if you're an employer, you must do X. If you're a place of public accommodation, you must do X. If you're a university, you must do X. I mean, not all laws are phrased that way, but the vast majority of the regulatory states seem to be something in that vein. So it seems like if you consider any conditional of that form to sort of necessarily uh, mean that this is a restriction of your strictly religious conscience because you can not do acts and you are not in, say, obliged to be an ax, um, which seems right, or is obliged to be an employer or, no. or whatever, um, then it seems like the, the restriction just becomes almost meaningless. Yeah, so that's that's a helpful question. Um, I think that we have allowed ourselves to use this expression, well, that violates my conscience, across a wide range of things where that's not what actually is happening and where, in fact, the relevant form of response is that's not an appropriate conditional to, exercise, to, to lay down with regard to the nature of a university or with regard to the nature of an employer-employee relationship or with regard to the nature of the medical profession. Right? I think the arguments that need to be made there are substantive arguments about what justice requires between employers and employees, about justice requires what the common good requires, what the nature of medicine with, requires with regard to the profession of medicine, and so on. Right? In each of these cases, um, some, as I said to Ed, some conditionals of that form obviously are legitimate, right? There are boundaries to what constitutes the legitimate pursuit of medicine, what constitutes legitimate practice in education. Um, the question is, where do those boundaries lie? And the argument that we need to have is they lie here rather than here, right? It's not a necessary part of justice and the common good that everybody be provided contraceptives as part of their health care because it's not part of health, for instance, right? Um, that seems to me a more productive place to, to lodge the argument than, than the violation of conscience. And so, yeah, the, the move that I made in response to Ed right, radically shrinks the amount of space in which the correct response is, no, that's, you're making me, you're coercing me to violate my conscience. Right? That's, that's a much smaller space, it seems to me, than we, think, we tend to think that it is. Yes, yeah, so thank you for the, the remarks. So much of the intricate and fascinating reason that you're engaged in here seems to uh, presuppose formally judgments that seem to me, it seems to me one has to get at in order to uh, raise limit questions. So, I mean, with respect to religion, in, specifically as a basic good, doesn't this require criteria to identify what a religion is? And hence, if someone in conscience thinks a religion is something other than those criteria, by definition, one is coercing his conscience, is one not? In other words, if, if, if we hold uh, religion as a basic good is, and we place any, def any definition we like, it could be anything, stipulate for argument. Someone in conscience says, no, I don't believe that. My religion is X. Our account of the basic good of religion, insofar as it's implemented legally, is in fact going to place a constraint on that person's religious conscience. It seems ineluctable. And so, I mean, I found myself wondering, is it an entailment of your analysis that, for example, a confessional state is not only something the prudential and historical circumstances for which simply don't exist, but something that is of its essence illicit. Uh, these are kind of bookend questions that have to do 
with what seems a premise uh, that establishes the eye of the needle through which this very carefully sculpted reasoning you've given us passes. So mm -hmm. that's the run. Yeah, okay, that's good, that's helpful. Um, so on the first side of the needle, I guess, um, the point that I made about the limits of state authority with regard to religion, I think, is important here. The state does have, I mean, religion is a good, right? So the state has some reason to promote it, right? In a way, I think this particular state that we exist in does not adequately do, right? I think its neutrality is, is detrimental to religion. It makes it seem as if, you know, being religious or unreligious, whatever, um, that's too much. Uh, but nevertheless, the state has quite limited authority with regard to determining what the correct religion is, for instance, or what sorts of religious rights are reasonable, what sorts of religious rights. So that that is a complicated question to then settle out where, where are the boundaries, and I think they're probably going to differ from reasonable state to reasonable state. Um, but when the state does set those boundaries, and it turns out that um, that the Church of the Holy Brothel in California is doesn't meet the standard Right, um, that it's not to be considered uh, an actual religion, but is a sex cult or something like that. Um, and so it says, no, you can't. You know, th these, these these activities, which will remain nameless, right, that you're engaging in, can't be because they're not protected religiously. And we've got various other reasons for thinking that they're unhealthy and unsanitary. And so please stop. Um, does that violate the conscience of the Church of the Holy Brothel? No, it doesn't. Right for the re for the reasons that I was trying to. To give right, they they take themselves to have some obligations, perhaps assuming that they're in good faith, right? And now the state is giving them an authoritative reason not to do those things. But, but, but may, may I can just ask yeah. more follow up? It's the um, <clears throat> it's the judgment that it isn't a, uh, a religion at all that seems to me the formal one. In other words, if someone conscientiously holds this is a religion, and the state says predicates its, its judgment on um, the truth, um, as uh, the Bhagwan said when he was on ABC News, they said, "Aren't you, aren't you uh, in danger of denying, uh, of imposing a religion?" And he said, "Oh no, I can tell you, there is no religion in my city." <laughs> that was the truest thing he ever said. Uh, but I mean, if one, if one, if, if one makes the formal judgment, the state makes the formal judgment, this is untrue. That this is a religion. Uh, it, it's not. It, it's not saying we wish to regulate you for health purposes, and it has a right. I mean, yeah. It's the formal definition that seems to necessarily have an implication of conscience. Right? This is yeah, I guess I still, I just, I don't see that claim. So some of these judgments are going to be judgments made on the basis of a lack of sincerity on the part of, right, that this is just a pretext, right? Um, but it seems to me that I would want to allow there to be also, the state makes judgments about, you know, what is reasonably considered part of people's pursuit of health and health care and, you know, and what's not. Um, I think it has a lot more room to, to make such judgments than it does with religion, but it has some, some, there are some boundaries to what the sorts of things that is reasonable for the state to consider to be religious. I do think on your second point that um, the limits of state authority do give me um, considerable pause with regard to the idea of a confessional state. Right? Um, it's not clear to me how the state can be the sort of thing that proclaims allegiance and faith in Jesus Christ, for instance. Um, it, it's just not obvious to me how it has the sort of personal quality characteristics that make that kind of act possible. But that's a, I know, I understand that that's a, that's a problematic claim for some people. I think we have time for one more question, and Brother Isaiah over in the corner has one. Thank you very much for your presentation. So I understand you gave us uh, a few principles of legislative prudence in the context of the talk, namely that attaching penalties to laws brings with it the foreseen consequence of people violating their conscience. Um, and then that because of the fragility of religious conscience, um, or the good that is being pursued through the conscientious judgment, um, the state should exercise extra restraint in attaching penalties to those laws for even making the laws in the first place. Just following on the previous question, I was looking for a little bit more clarification perhaps one step more material in 
what sorts of patterns of behavior that, as we said, people have all sorts of patterns of behavior they consider religious. And there seem to be, in our current culture, many patterns of behavior that perhaps are more similar to religion than the people performing them are even willing to accept. I'm wondering whether there is a clear boundary between religious patterns of behavior and simply moral patterns of behavior in general uh, that you could institute for a uh, body of legislator, legislators in a secular culture like ours. Sure. Um, well, let me go at it maybe from a slightly sideways point of view that might might not seem like it's directly getting at what you're doing. But um, so there's this question in a lot of contemporary thought about law and religion. Is religion special or not, right? Is there some reason to think that religion deserves these special considerations, um, say, that we find in the First, First Amendment? And one objection that people commonly raise to that is to say, well, what about conscience? Right? Why is religion special in a way that conscience is not special? And I think, I mean, in some ways, the, um, this paper comes out a little bit on the side of not too special, right? Because considerations of conscience also matter in very much like the same way that, um, that considerations of, of religion do, right? Um, if you're prevented from doing what you take yourself to have good reason to do, uh, that doesn't mean, on my account, that doesn't mean that you're being forced to violate your conscience, but it is the case that your liberty is being restricted and your liberty of conscience is being restricted in ways that, have, that there have to be some reasonable justifications for. Um, and I guess part of maybe what I would want to say, I need to think about this more, is that although there do need to be some boundary drawings, right, and certainly around the question of what are sincere affirmations of an obligation to do something in conscience or sincere affirmations of an obligation to do something for religious reasons, right, we want to screen out the obvious insincerities. This is also true in medicine. We screen out the people who aren't, in fact, trying to make people healthier, but are just trying to make a buck for themselves, right? You screen out that, and then you say, and then you have this presumption of liberty, right? And you, and you heighten that presumption of liberty when people make the sincere affirmation that what they're concerned with is something that they've judged in, conscien in conscience that they have an obligation to do or a religious obligation to do. Then maybe you don't need to spend too, too much time working out the boundaries, the strict boundaries of what religion is as opposed to non-religious reasons, right? What's going to matter is people saying that they have, they take themselves to have good reasons to do something, right? And the states either having or not having good enough reasons to say, no, don't do that, right? And if the presumption is the state should not say, don't do that, when it doesn't have very good reasons to do that, then that's sufficient, right? We don't need to have, at that point, a very well-worked-out account of precisely what the boundaries of religion or non-religion are. Please join me in thanking Dr. Paulson for his...